Miss Gesine Haik. She is uh, from uh, she is from Precision Nanosystems, and she is going to talk about RNA lipid nanoparticles, a robust and potent tool for gene knockdown and expression in primary neurons. I think if you want to know how to make them, you just can visit her at her booth. Uh, Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks. Correct. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. So. Um, or for the nice introduction. So I'm um, thankful that we had so many nice presentations on um, nanoparticle uptake models and uh, uh, uptake mechanisms. And I think my talk is a nice roundup with a practical application on nanoparticles that are taken up with an active mechanism. Um, and these are RNA containing lipid nanoparticles. And yes, I work with, with Precision Nanosystems. We're a biotech company based in Vancouver, Canada. So it's been a long way across the Atlantic to come here, but it's, uh, it was worth it so far. So a small reminder of why we want to package RNA into lipid nanoparticles. This is because RNA is a very sensitive molecule. We want to protect it from degradation. It is very hard to get RNA into cells, so we need to get a vehicle to get it into the cells, to be taken up by the cells, and also to be delivered into the cytoplasm. And we do this with, let me see, is this a laser? Yes. Um, with these uh, fairly complicated nanoparticles here, which are neutral at pH uh, 7.4, so at physiological pH. You can see we have a lot of components in here, uh, um, five all in all. So the, the oligonucleotide, the RNA, is encapsulated inside. We have um, uh, an ionizable lipid, in fact, not a cationic lipid. Then we have a layer of a helper lipid outside and also a peg layer to prevent aggregation of these particles. And the way we, we prepare these particles is in a one-step process with the nanoassembler platform that I can show you uh, at the booth outside. Um, so it's, um, it's actually a very simple process where we have a microfluidic chip and this is a schematic of this microfluidic chip and channel and mixing chamber where we have, so we have two inlet ports here and in one inlet port we um, in, have the uh, buffer containing the RNA. In the other inlet port we put the lipid contained in an organic solvent such as ethanol. And once these components reach the mixing chamber, uh, this mixing chamber is uh, features structures that are called st staggered herringbone mixers, and that allows the two fluids to mix in a very controlled manner. We're in, in laminar flow here, and these fluids fold into each other, so that means that the surface area um, where the, the fluids get in contact is increased uh, potentially, and um, or by high potency, and um, that allows the mixing of these fluids in a very fast and controlled manner. And that allows us, again, to produce these particles in a very defined way. So we can actually define the particle size by using different parameters, by using different ratios of the fluids or different uh, flow speeds in the, uh, in the microfluidic channel. And we can then tune these micro, uh, nanoparticles by their size and also uh, we can influence the polydispersity of these nanoparticles and we can get down to a 0 0.02 to, uh, polydispersity, which is, which is quite a nice, uh, nice, uh, nice achievement there. But uh, let's get more into the biological field here. So the way these nanoparticles work is that I said that they're neutrally charged and they have a peg layer to be protected. Once they are injected uh, into, well, in, vi uh, in vivo, the peg layer comes up, and then these particles associate with APOE in vivo. And if you actually look at these particles, if you're familiar with um, lipid nano, the, our in endogenous lipid nanoparticles like LDL and HDL, you will actually see that this is a very similar structure. And that is why APOE associates with these particles. And then they dock to the LDL receptor they're internalized, and so we have endocytosis. They get into the endosome. They're still neutrally charged. Once this endosome becomes a lysosome, the pH goes down. They take up their charge again. The lysosome breaks, and they're um, 
discharged into the cytosol. Right. Where then the uh, knockdown or gene expression can be enhanced. So as I said, this is an APOE-related mechanism, and this is basically the in vitro data for that here. This is was done in the primary neurons, knowing that primary neurons are hard to transfect cells, and it's nice to know that this mechanism actually works in, in these really difficult to transfect cells. Um, and here we just have these primary neurons um, where we put these lipid nanoparticles but did not any, uh, add any APOE. We see there is no uptake of these lipid nanoparticles, whereas if we add APOE, we have a nice red fluorescence of cells from the, the marked or the labeled lipid of the nanoparticles and it merges nicely with the cells. We can obviously also do some uh, genomic studies in there because if we take up the, the nanoparticles and the RNA doesn't do anything, that doesn't help us much. So here, um, the particles were loaded with siRNA against uh, the P10 gene. And all I want to show you here, in fact, is that at a dose of up to 10, nano, about 10 nanograms per milliliter siRNA, we can achieve a nearly 100% knockdown in uh, these primary neurons. Toxicologically, this is interesting because one of the main problems right now for transfection agents is that most of them are, are toxic because of positive charges on the surface. They can hardly be used in vivo. Because these particles are neutral, their toxicity is considerably reduced. So here, my colleagues used up to 40 times uh, of the effective dose that we had here, 10 nanograms per milliliter. So this is 40 times that dose and we could see that there was pretty much no toxicity at all. These particles uh, allow knockdown for up to 29, uh, 21 days um, and even longer. I'm just gonna run through these slides a bit because I know we're also very late, so feel free to stop me anytime if you have more questions. One point uh, with primary or cells or in fact, most of it, we have with, with uh, stem cells and primary cells is that it is very hard to transfect at early stages. Uh, so if you, you, you usually want the cells to settle in the Petri dish and then you can transfect them, then you know they're stable. So you can only transfect them usually at something like day 13, day, in vitro day 13 or 14. And um, here we want to show that this is possible because the, the, the mechanism is not very toxic and very active. You can start transfecting your cells at even day two and you have an efficient um, gene knockdown up to day 16. You can also do gene expression. Here, this is a newer data that we have. Uh, here we loaded these nanoparticles with an mRNA that encodes GFP. And then we took these primary neurons and incubated them or exposed them with these mRNA lipid nanoparticles for up to 24 hours. And you can see nicely that uh, you, have, you can achieve an up to 70% and sustained expression of GM, uh, GFP over 72 hours. And here you can see that the uptake of the lipid nanoparticles is pretty much complete, 100% of these particles were taken up. And the way this experiment was done was that nanoparticles were, um, here, oh, sorry. Nanoparticles were given onto the cells and then they were washed and then the, the gene expression was measured. I'm going back to gene knockdown now, but we're getting into the in vivo data. So in this experiment, we're still uh, in the knockdown of the P10 gene. This experiment was performed in mice, and uh, here the nanoparticles were directly injected into the brain, and then the P10 expression was measured at a distance from the injection site of up to three milli millimeters, and we can see that um, there is a gene knockdown, an efficient gene knockdown of up 
for, well, very efficient of up to 0.5 millimeters, but even one millimeter we have, um, well, what is it? Well, over 50% basically of the knockdown. And this can be sustained for up to 15 days. I ran through my presentation. <laughs> I hope you're ready for coffee. Uh, some acknowledgements to do. Um, and also, please feel free to come and see us. We're at the booth with Schaefer Tech because they're starting to help us here in Europe. Um, visit our website and they contact me anytime for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Hoik, for this uh, very interesting talk. I have one technical question, the other for the concept of these nanoparticles. Um, what is the encapsulation efficiency that you reach with this apparatus, and can you check this online? Uh, you mean in a model? No, or not in a model, but online during the synthesis. So you do the preparation there. We looked at this yesterday, mm -hmm. and then it gets into some kind of like uh, Eppendorf or something, but could you check for the encapsulation efficiency, which means that how much RNA is left in the supernatant and not encapsulated online? All right, so um, first question, the encapsulation efficiency with these particular nanoparticles is of 90, over 96%. So we're pretty much encapsulating everything. And the reason for that is that we, are, we have a complexation reaction here where the negatively charged oligonucleotide reacts, well, not reacts, but um, interacts, thank you for that word, with uh, these ionizable lipid nanoparticles, right? And so do you know how much is actually attached to the surface of these particles? None. Yeah, none. Uh, I, don't, I can't tell you which assay we use for this because these are the biologists that do that, but uh, the particle itself really is neutral on the surface. All the, all the complexes are inside and that is what makes this particle advantages for, advantageous for um, in vivo use. Mm, okay. yeah. and, and for the inline um, measurement, that is something we're obviously looking into. We have this, uh, the, these kind of uh, assays set up for the scale up instrument where you want to do inline production uh, and measurement of your nanoparticles. So we have a, a, a larger instrument where we can make uh, mm. large volumes of these RNA particles, mm. and you can actually s scale up seamlessly. So you make your particles on the benchtop instrument, and when you have set up your, well, when you have your optimized formulation, you go immediately onto the scale-up instrument. The dimensions that are used in the mixing on the scale-up are exactly the same as on the benchtop instrument. For Thank the benchtop instrument, it's not, it's not handy because it's a small mm. and mm very fast way of making particles. Okay. Maybe the conceptual question we can talk over during coffee. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Question? yeah, I was trying to think ahead a little bit of your um, in vivo experiments. And um, can you go and uh, derive information on what dosing would be required uh, if you would go intravenously with your substance uh, from taking how far uh, the, the gene knockdown was measurable in, in mouse tissue when you, when you went for direct injection? This is a very good question. We have not looked into this ourselves. No. I, will, I can go back and ask my colleagues if they know more about this, um, but it would definitely be an interesting thing to look into. What we rely on until now, because the transfection of RNA mm. into these uh, primary cells is very new because it it, it's just so difficult it's right. to, to, yeah. to achieve. So we now rely, rely on data that's been put out there before, and we can just go from there. All right, thanks a yeah. lot. Thank you. Are there any other questions? This is another case. I would like to join you with, uh, you know, I'd like you to join me in thanking all the speakers um, of this session. feel free to, to ask the questions outside on, on the coffee break and so feel free to ask them.